All right, so let's talk about mobility enhancement. That's in the context of uh, previously having discussed the threshold voltage, how to control it. We talked about short channel effects, where it's important to uh, mitigate effects due to the uh, large applied drain voltage that is now uh, starting to impinge on the gate potential or the electrostatic potential under the gate. And we had written down that uh, the uh, drain voltage, uh, drain current capability uh, scales as Vg minus Vth squared, or ideally as some, some alpha in the short channel, it's closer to one, right? And there is a mobility up front in this uh, current expression. So let's look at uh, effects of mobility on this and see if there's some enhancements to be had. All right. So we had talked way back when in the course about mobility and phonon and doping scattering, right? So you have electrons in the channel now, and they're scattering, they're always scattering. Equilibrium is a very busy place. And we can talk about uh, channels becoming quasi-ballistic, but then you still end up defining something like an equivalent mobility and um, use these concepts. But for a longer channel device, uh, we had discussed how the mobility depends on temperature. So this was the curve as a function of temperature. And as you increase the doping, the mobility goes down. Okay. So the other components next. So the fact that um, for low doping, when you have a high mobility and you increase the temperature, those are phonons that are interacting with the electrons slowing down. It's the lattice vibrating, interacting uh, with the electrons causing scattering. Now, so and that gives you a certain slope here, right, as a function of temperature. Now, as you increase the doping, you introduce more uh, dopants, right? You have more foreign atoms in there. You have ionized doping, uh, ionized dopant scattering. You can think of these as coulombic potentials that the electron sees and they have to navigate those potentials. And the more potentials you have, the lower the mobility. So we had seen that before and here's a sketch of this uh, mobility, right? So as you increase uh, the doping this way, the mobility goes down like this, right? And here's a sketch for, from the textbook from, for electrons and for holes, uh, for different dopants, okay? So we know dopants play a role and phonons play a role. But there's now in these uh, other scale, lower scale devices, there's another effect. As these electrons march along in a pretty narrow channel, they explore the interface roughness of the uh, silicon dioxide. And I had shown earlier atomistic simulations of nanowires where we modeled that explicitly. So there's something uh, for larger scale devices that has been classified really well. Uh, it's called the universal mobility curve, where you combine these curves that we have here uh, uh, of temperature dependence and of uh, doping dependence, which are sort of summarized in these curves, right? So for lower temperatures, you find that as um, this is now as a function of electric field, and that electric field pushes the electrons into the oxide, into the oxide or towards the interface. So as you increase the fields for different doping levels, you ultimately capture these slopes here. And these slopes are different from the behavior as a function of different dopants. So here are dopant. Uh, uh, um, scattering rates or dopant dominated um, effects. And since this is here at th uh, 77 Kelvin and 300 Kelvin, you see the phonon effect is in there as well by, as you increase the temperature, as you increase the temperature, mobility goes down. Okay. But this is called the universal mobility curve and at high gate uh, and high electric fields at the, at the gate region, um, surface roughness scattering is becoming a dominant mechanism. And remember Matheson's rule, we add those inverse mobilities, we add, rate, add the, the rates, right? So you can come up with an effective um, mobility model that works like this. And down here, 
for large electric field, you have a surface roughness being dominant. All right. Now, let's talk a little bit about the basics of strain and what that might do for your system. So if you had, for example, silicon here on a, on a certain lattice site, and you try to grow germanium on top of that, which has a larger lattice constant, your Legos don't quite fit, right? If you want to use that analogy. That means the upper ones, since they don't have as much plastic energy as the substrate, have to adjust themselves in order to fit onto the substrate. So they have to increase or decrease their bond length and, and be squeezed on there, okay? So they in this case here, you see this lattice constant here is larger than this, right? So now they have to adjust themselves here and you have biaxial strain. So they're compressed in this direction and they expand into this direction then, okay? So strain materials can increase uh, the mobility um, and that has to do with you modifying the band structure. We had calculated in periodic potentials and in the uh, transmission coefficient calculations where you varied the width of these barriers, the quasi-atoms, so to speak, and you could modify the effective masses and the slopes of the bands. So that is what you can do here in, on a nanometer scale. You modify the band structure and therefore modify the mobility in the system. So you can enhance the mobility in these channels. This can be done in a very systematic way, and that has been pursued for the last two decades. Really, since, ever since the year 2000, all the transistors that are in the marketplace, maybe 2002, are strained. They're strained silicon. So you might have a, a silicon germanium uh, a strained la strain layer under the silicon, and that silicon is now strained. So there's a variety of incarnations of this uh, that have been uh, performed where you have a single channel, dual channel and heterostructure um, uh, structures. So this is quite a field of research and I would like to just highlight that that exists. You can uh, learn about that through more detailed simulations or read up in the literature, but all transistors that you buy today are having strained built in if they are two-dimensional structure. Now, how to embed strain in a FinFET where you have two open surfaces is yet another form of art. And uh, there's now nano sheets that are strained, so this is a, a continually evolving story. Now, here is an example uh, of some data of this device that here uh, is shown from the year 2005 that for the PMOS, the strain had a little bit of effect, so you can raise the mobility up for the holes a little bit. For the electrons, the effect was rather dramatic, so you can almost double the mobility for an NMOS. But this was not a good solution or not enough of a solution for the PMOS. For the PMOS, another uh, solution came into place. I'll show that in the uh, next segment and here, but this is uniaxial compressive strain. That's another mode of strain, different deformation of the crystal, and there you could get enhancement for the PMOS. Now, there's something else that was really cool uh, that was discovered actually through quantum simulations by my best friend Chris Bone at TI. Remember we had these really strange looking valence bands that are not quite spheres, but they had these bulging out, maybe I should have sketched that here, um, isosurfaces of continuous um, uh, constant energy surfaces for the whole bands. And depending on how you rotate that in a channel for a device, you can have different mobilities. So the normal production process is on a 111 a 110 surface, and the transistors were oriented in the uh, 001 direction or the minus 110 directions, okay? But by rotating the substrate around for NMOS and for PMOS, you can actually get quite a bit of performance increase. And that has to do with the details of um, the band structure of the bulk material that is now being confined into 
um, into narrow channels. And that's where band structure engineering plays a role. And the details of that, you need some uh, models uh, that help you understand ele electron bands and whole bands in quantized systems. So here's some example that we carried through for electrons and how strain and geometry can play a role on boosting uh, transistor performance. So imagine that you have a wafer and you can place these finfets or gate all around wires or double uh, gate wires or slabs in there and you play with different materials. So we played with a variety of materials. So here's silicon in different crystal directions under different strain. Then people have worried and wondered about indium gallium arsenide as a, a good channel material. And then we looked at silicon at other uh, strain conditions as well. All right, the interesting thing is that for such uh, nanowire structures where you go from bulk values that are sketched in here to wires that are six by six nanometers down to three by three nanometer cross sections, the effective mass can actually be tuned and changed. So these different materials under different strain conditions can have vastly different transport masses. And those are the masses that are directed in the channel direction. That's the ones that, that um, enter the transport simulation in terms of velocities and density of states, et cetera, that are uh, accounting for transport electrons. So the key message to take away here is without a whole lot of explanation uh, that effective masses can be tuned and they depend on strain, they depend on geometry. So the effective mass is no longer just a bulk material. And it turns out uh, a, a light effective mass may not be the material you like. Sometimes you might want to have a heavy mass. And here's an example of some calculations where we explored a, a double gate device, a tri gate device. So this is kind of like a FinFET and a gate all around device. And we picked um, the material here and 110 uh, silicon, where the effective mass was relatively light. We assumed this an effective oxide thickness, and we discussed what that means in the course, and had a VDD of 0.5 volt. Now, if you take the double gate device, which is kind of the simplest one, so to speak, in, in terms of geometries, you see that the turnoff characteristics aren't all that good. Uh, you get a reasonable current of 1,000 uh, milliamp per micron, uh, a microam per micrometer. So here's the double gate, 900 is the peak you can get. That's not bad, but the sub-threshold swing, the slope of these curves is 101. And remember, 60 is the best you can get in this device. And the drain and use barrier lowering, so that's the, um, remember we had the sketch here with the uh, potentials that uh, for short channels, the, the barrier is being lowered. You measure that in terms of millivolt per volt applied, that's a very high value. So this one really suffers here in the off current and you get an off current that is really way high. Now, if you look at a tri-gate structure, you can actually get more current out. So the peak goes up from 900 to 2000. Uh, your slope becomes steeper from 101 to 91 and also the drain and use barrier lowering gets smaller. Now, if you look at the gate all around that has the perfect electrostatic control, so to speak, where you can really shut off, you get actually more current out. The sub-threshold also in, uh, decreases and also the dibble decreases. So this is out of that material class. This is the best performing device here, but it's also, of course, the hardest one to make, to really make a gate that goes all around this wire. Another aspect of this is source drain tunneling, meaning You'd like to have a barrier here that shuts off the current, but if your mass is light, you actually end up tunneling through this device quite a bit. So in a double gate where you don't have good gate control, this barrier is actually uh, not very strong and you have a lot of tunneling current. And in fact, the off current consists of 96% of tunneling current. And if you have a gate all around device, you can, uh, uh, in, have a better gate control and the tunneling current is only 45% of the, of the off current. So you can shut off the device better. So 
putting some of this together, this is sort of an eye chart. You can now have an exploration of exploring different fin widths versus different strains in the system and find your sweet spot of maximizing the injection velocity of the carriers, which will give you the best current flow and you like it to be red, so high velocity. So you would want to be down in this design uh, regime. So with tools that are being developed, you can now begin to explore uh, design spaces for those kind of uh, uh, devices. Good. So let me summarize uh, the last segment. Uh, MOSFETs have pretty strong s scaling issues of making them any better and shorter. There's short channel effects, there's discrete doping effects, there's interface roughness, there's gate tunneling, there's source tunneling, and uh, new ma materials are being discussed. There's no winners yet. In fact, I would argue the winner will be silicon. And uh, there's different architecture I talked about, like a tunneling FET or an NC FET. That is not clear yet either. So uh, high mobility may not be the most important thing because you have the source drain tunneling. You want to have a barrier that prevents electron flow. And uh, the contacts will become more and more important and begin to dominate the device performance. I haven't spent much time talking about that, but it's really how do you get the electrons into the transistor, into the source, uh, to then be modulated is actually a big challenge as well. And effective masks and band gaps can be engineered. They're not just bulk properties anymore. We can design those properties. So with that, we're wrapping up sort of in a whirlwind uh, aspects of uh, the modern uh, MOSFET. We've reached this segment here where we talked about mobility enhancements. And I hope you've learned some aspects of this MOS technology in the last few segments. And overall, you've begun to appreciate some of the semiconductor devices. And I will have multiple exercises throughout the course where you can um, explore NanoHub uh, simulations to visualize some of these effects. So I thank you very much for uh, being in the course and I'll um, see you around. Thank you.